That would really be interesting. Maybe someday we'll do that. I saw something unique this morning. Uh, I saw Ashley filming her mother playing the offertory. Usually that's the other way around. And I think, boy, when Debbie grows up, <laughs> Ashley's going to really enjoy watching her mom back when she was so young playing her violin in church. That'll be neat. Yeah. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, I know that. But do other Christians? Scott is a dentist who spends his day looking into people's mouths. And while his job affords him a lifestyle that is upper middle class, he makes good money, his life itself is in the process of unraveling. Scott is a Christian, a church member at a local Baptist church, but his life is in chaos because recently he committed a crime. He was arrested, booked, and his mugshot ended up on television in the news. People in church are embarrassed of Scott's behavior because his first and his first Sunday in church after the news report of his arrest, it was interesting. Scott has expressed remorse, he's repentant, but interacting with other believers now is awkward. Monique is a stay-at-home mom who feels frazzled by her daily work with her children. She spends all day parenting these children who are very active and very young. By the time her husband gets home from his job, she's usually worn out. And he's tired too. And her hope is that the evenings will be getting the kids to bed as early as possible and then some adult conversation. They sometimes arrive late to church. And it's, it's a, mainly because... It's just difficult getting the kids out the door. Her days are so wearying that her emotional energy is low. And she wants to show Christ's love to others. I mean, she's not entirely needy, but her life is so child-focused that it's hard for her to do. She needs love uh, from other people. Richard and Wendy just started visiting a Baptist church. They were heavily involved in another church in their town until a serious problem forced them to change churches. It was personally painful, and they lost friendships in their move. It not only impacted them, but they also uh, had problems because their children lost their own friends. This is something they haven't had to do in years, and now they feel a bit lost and very lonely. They were active in their other church, in the one another's, but now they need someone to show a little love to them. Nancy is in her mid-30s. She's alone. She's single and doesn't have anyone to come home to at night. She battles loneliness and, like, and, and feels like her life is just work, going to church, and then doing a lot of things by herself. She wants to have relationships in her life, but she's struggling to form friendships. She has a good church family, but most of the people in her church have families of their own. Her life is a lot different from theirs. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know. But what about the followers of Jesus? Do they love me? Do I love them? I want you to think about all the ways people are needy of love. Teenagers who are in that awkward stage between childhood and adulthood. The guy whose career is in upheaval, or the family who just lost their home in a house fire, or the young couple who just relocated to America from another country and don't speak the language very well, or the child who's having problems with difficult parents, or the elderly man who just lost his wife, or the young couple who would like to have children but can't get pregnant, or the young couple who just had a child eh, but he has a life-altering disease. Jesus loves me. But what about the church? This is a very interesting fact. If you look at the text in John 15, here's this parable of the farmer and the vine and the branches. And you find this parable where growing from these vine, this vine are these branches, and there's an obvious love for the farmer, for the vine and the branches, but there's something that doesn't really fit our understanding of how vines work. There's an expectation in the passage that the branches would love other branches. That emphasis is a little strange. 
you don't find branches on vines really showing love to other branches. But the branches, Jesus says, should love the other branches true, too. The farmer loves the vine and the branches. The vine loves the branches. The branches, the vine says, should love other branches. Shouldn't the text really be about the branches loving the vine back? Have you ever thought about this? I mean, this is kind of how the Bible typically reads, right? God loves us. Jesus loves us. We should love him back. And so you kind of expect to find that in this parable, but it actually isn't there. The entire flow of love in this parable is farmer to vine, vine to branches, branches to other branches. It's not really presented as reciprocal. It doesn't go back the other way. And it's interesting to me because really what it demonstrates is God's expectation for us, for the branches off of the vine Jesus, that we should have love for other branches. We should have love for others that are in our church, that are part of his church. Jesus loves me. And the obvious application of that love, we would think, is that we should love him back. But the application that he gives is that because he loves me, I should love others. His love for me is the example of how I should be thinking and treating other people, other Christians. That love flows farmer vine, vine to branches, branches to branches. So would you consider with me first that Jesus expects love to be one of our greatest virtues? We should always be loving Jesus, of course. He says, continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. There's a sense in which we are living in the love of Jesus. That word continue and abide in verses 9 and 10 are from the same word that just means to remain, to, to stay in that place of love. Don't move away, Jesus says, from the place of my love. Make your home here. Set up residence here. Live in my love. And this love is demonstrated by obedience to Jesus' commands, even as he kept his father's commands, which is the idea of guarding something or observing something. It's the idea of being careful to obey. Jesus demonstrates that love because he is submitting himself to his father's will, and that is the same for us. We should demonstrate the love of Jesus by living in his commands, obeying his commands. But that virtue of love is, is more than just abiding in Jesus' love, but it's that we would always be loving others. Look at verse 12. This is my command. You must love one another. Do you see it in the... Look right in the text. What does your Bible say? This is my command. You must love others. Look at verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. This is a command that we should keep, that we should have in obedience, in loving other believers. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. This is the law of Christ. You are no longer under Old Testament law. You are under the law of grace. But, but there is a law that you must obey, and it's the law of Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. This really is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law, that you would show love to other people. I mean, you think about those laws that demonstrate uh, all in the Old Testament that God lays out for you, that you show that you are one of his. He says in the sixth commandment, you shouldn't murder. Let me tell you something. You don't murder people you love. He says you shouldn't commit adultery. You don't commit adultery against the spouse that you love. He says that you shouldn't bear false witness. You don't bear false witness. You don't tell lies, especially in a court about somebody you love. He says you shouldn't covet other people's things. You don't covet the things of other people that you love. 
It's when you're jealous and envious of other people. That's not love. You see, all of those laws are all based on love. What about have, honoring your mother and father? Isn't that a, about love? I'm going to tell you something, friends. All those Old Testament laws that show relationship between one to another, all of them are fulfilled if you love people, if you love others. This is the command, Jesus says. This is the law of Christ. And it's an order from a superior to an inferior. From the commanding general to his troops, I command you to love others. And there's no condition that the other branch has to meet for a different branch to show that kind of love. There's no condition another Christian has to meet to receive this love. Now, I'll say this. There is a condition given that you love one another it is other branches on the vine. I read almost every week in news articles and the comments that people make in news articles, people misunderstanding and taking the Bible and making it mean something it doesn't mean. And this week, I actually read something about this verse because whatever the news article was about, somebody decided to make a comment that, that really we should, all Christians, you, this person was a non-Christian, and he was trying to throw it in the face of whoever had made a previous comment, well, shouldn't Christians love other people? And it was just kind of all of mankind. That's really not what's being presented here. This is a branch loving another branch on the same vine. The one another's that Jesus describes in the New Testament are one another's that we do for other believers in our church. We pray for one another. We exhort one another. We encourage one another. We try to lift up one another. We sometimes even have to admonish one another. We confess our faults one to another. And my friends, we love one another. That's the command, is that within this body of believers that we have right here, we should be showing love one for another. All of us should be loving each other. And this is the command that Jesus gives. And so in this sense, if you are on the vine, as I am on the vine, then I should be showing love to you and you should be showing love to me. And not only does Jesus say this should be one of our greatest virtues, but in saying this to the disciples, what Jesus is actually doing is saying, come, follow me. Jesus commands people to do something that he himself is already doing. Can I say it this way, number two? Jesus is the highest example of love. The Father's love for the Son is our example. Look at verse 9. As the Father has loved me. Now this word love is the chiefest form of love. It takes the other person's situation into regard. It's thinking solely about the other person. It prizes the other person above everything else. It's unwilling to abandon another person. Often, this word for love has been defined this way. Giving without expecting return. It's not giving and saying, what can I get back? It's giving, saying, even if I get nothing back, I'm still going to give because I love. And Jesus says, this is the kind of love that the God the Father has for him, that the farmer has for the vine. There is a love relationship between the farmer and his vine. And this is something I don't even think we can fully comprehend. That within the Godhead itself, there is a love between Father and Son and Spirit that is so perfect and so complete that when we start to think about it, our minds just kind of explode. But Jesus says, this is the kind of love that we should be having because not only does this the kind of love that the Father has for Jesus, but Jesus says, in the like manner, so I have loved you. Look at those little words. Look at verse 9. What does Jesus say here? Look directly at the text. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Those little words are really important, as and so. As means according to, and it links to the little word so. 
So means in the same manner as. So in the way that God loves Jesus, in that same manner, Jesus says, I love you. The love that Jesus has for you, if you are a follower of Christ, if you are a believer, that love that Jesus has for you, that's the same kind of love that God the Father has for Jesus. It really is that incredible. It's that, it's that strong, it's that unbreakable, it's that unchanging. It really is amazing. And when you think of how much God the Father loves His Son, my friends, then you need to realize it's that kind of love that Jesus has for us. So I have loved you. Jesus loves me the same way the Father loves Him. And Jesus has the highest form of love. And I can't explain it, not fully. I can't even describe it fully because there is no reason why Jesus should love us like that. I mean, you look at this kind of love that the Father has for the Son, and that's kind of explainable in the sense that, of course, God the Father is going to love God the Son. I mean, that makes sense. Jesus is holy. Jesus is perfect. He has all the qualities that we would want to have for someone we would love. I mean, who wouldn't love Jesus? Except Satan and people who follow Satan. When we think of Jesus loving us, it breaks down a bit because Jesus loves me, but I don't have those same qualities. I don't have that great, l wonderful lovingness that Jesus has. There's no reason why God should love me like this. We're not that lovable. But he says he loves us in the same manner as the Father loves him. And my friends, when you think about that, that really should make you realize how great Jesus' love is. How incredible his love is. Now, not only should we love others like Jesus loves, and not only should our love for others be like Jesus' love, but it should be to the same extent that Jesus loves. And so this is number three. This nature or the nature of this love is supreme sacrifice. I think probably this is where it breaks down in my life. It's a threshold. If you were in debate, I used to debate in high school and college. We call this the threshold argument. Okay, A threshold is, is the limit or extent to which something operates. That's the threshold. And you always want to give kind of a threshold idea because when somebody makes a statement, it's kind of open-ended. But a threshold kind of puts an end to it. It closes the end. It says, um, I'll help you out on Saturday. doesn't mean I'll help you out from 12.01 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. It means sometime on Saturday I'm going to help you out. There's a threshold. All right, maybe if it's between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., there's a threshold. So this threshold is given. And what kind of threshold do you expect? Jesus says in verse 12, here's the extent of his love. His supreme sacrifice is exposed in his love for his disciples. He says, as I have loved you. Look at verse 12. You love others as I have loved you. And now we have that little word as again. And it's really important because it means in the same manner. In the, to the same extent, there's the threshold. And that's a pretty big threshold, isn't it? I'm supposed to love other people to the same extent, in the same manner, that Jesus loves me. And remember, Jesus loves me to the same extent that the Father loves him. And if, when I'm so blown away and amazed at how great it is that Jesus loves me, because I'm not very lovable, then I really stop to think, how important is it that I love other people to that same extent? Can I even do that? And am I even trying to do that? Let me just stop for a moment 
and go back to those stories I was giving at the beginning when you were kind of letting your mind wander. You know that moment. Kind of like now for some of you. Come back, come back. You, you think about fictional stories like that. They're made up, but they're not made up. There are stories like that in churches all over the world today. People who are Christians who have done things that are wrong, and the whole church now is kind of looking at them with that really judgy look of, I can't believe you did that, forgetting that in our own hearts we've done those kinds of sins all the time, forgetting that we are also sinners saved by grace. And instead of embracing the repenting sinner, we, we have a tendency to kind of push him away and push him out. Or we think about people who are lonely or people who are difficult or people who are in trouble or people who are just struggling with daily life. And you go through all those scenarios that I gave and you realize that it's very hard sometimes to love those kinds of people because it just means a lot of work on our behalf. My friends, did Jesus not love you when you were a lot of work? Does he not still love you even though you are a lot of work? This is re where the application really becomes serious because at this point, it's saying, okay, if I'm going to love like Jesus loves, then I have to love like the Father loved him. I've really got to do something different because this is just not my nature at all. This is not who I am normally. Jesus says I'm supposed to love people as he loved me. The threshold of my love for others needs to be to the same extent. It needs to be to the same power, to the same strength that he has for me. And you might say, well, how much is that? We'll look at verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This love is demonstrated in Jesus' death on the cross. This explains the threshold of what love is to be regarding self-sacrifice. Jesus calls the disciples his friends in verse 14. Thus, his death on the cross is an example of that kind of love. Jesus dies for those he loves. How, how broad, how wide, how high, how deep should our love be for other believers? It should be to the point of death. It should be to the point of the ultimate Sacrifice of death. In our country, we just celebrated Veterans Day. And we celebrate in May, Memorial Day. And we shake the hands of those who have given sacrifice to give us our freedoms. We appreciate them. I, I will tell you that as a veteran, I, I just am blown away sometimes by how people are so gracious. To me, I... I didn't think about it when I joined when I was 17, that this is kind of what life would be like 30 some years later. But it's great. People say, thank you for your service. And I'm just kind of, okay, all right, yeah, sure. You know, it was a long time ago, but absolutely. It's wonderful to have that kind of experience. But then you think about people who've really given, who've really sacrificed. I've got, I've got in my window a flag with a blue star in the middle. The blue star means there's somebody in my family who is in the service. Do you know when you have a yellow star what that means? It means somebody in your family died in the service. And we, we hold those people up and, with honor, and we should. They've, they've given, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, the last full measure of devotion. And we, and we think that's so great. But my friends, we should all have in our homes and in our hearts gold stars representing the death kind of love that we have to other people. We should love to that same extent. And this is, I'm just telling you, I know this is what's going through your mind. You may, Maybe you haven't verbalized it in your head. Maybe you haven't codified it in your heart. Okay. I, I'm willing to give you a little slack because I'll just tell you what's going through my mind. I don't see how in the world I can do that. And I'm not even sure if I'm willing to do that. 
I jokingly tell people, I give you one move every three or five years or something like that. You know, you want to move? I'll come. We'll bring people over. We'll help you move. But but we're only going to move once. You, you can't keep moving every year. All right? I don't want to keep carrying your couch down three flights of stairs every year. All right? It's just not going to do it. I'm getting older. It's becoming more difficult. It's not fun. I always hurt my hands on the door, on the sides of the doors when I'm carrying things out. I just don't like doing it. And so I say every few years. Do you know where that came from? We had a lady here many years ago who moved about every year. I carried that gal's washing machine up three flights of stairs more than once. And I don't know how many lamps she had. And they were all brass and heavy. And I kept thinking, you know, and finally I just said to her, you can't keep moving. I, I just can't help you move every year, every six months. We have to stop. You have to stop moving. And you know what that was? That was me verbalizing to her, I love me more than you. That's really what it was. I mean, I really don't have problems loving myself. Maybe you weren't aware of that. I could probably give you some ex examples if you need them privately of how much I love myself. But in doing so, and with all the laughter I see on your faces, you love yourself too, so don't lie. Loving self isn't hard. Loving self is easy. Our, a psychologist worry about people not loving themselves? That's ridiculous. We all love ourselves. We love ourselves sometimes in very strange ways. Some people really struggle with understanding what that means, but I'm going to tell you something. We love ourselves. And to love someone else to a greater extent, to love someone like Jesus loves me, like God loves the Father and loves him, to love somebody to that extent, I'm just telling you that as I've been meditating this all week, I've been thinking, I don't know how I'm even able to do that because I'm not even sure how I want to. And I'll just tell you what that exposes in my own heart. That exposes how little of Jesus' love for me I truly appreciate and understand. And that ought to be exposing to you the same thing. Because what Jesus did was Jesus went to the cross. Jesus suffered on the cross. He suffered physically and he suffered spiritually. He, he really agonized on the cross. And if I'm to love other people to that extent, to that threshold, well, friends, now we're talking about a real game changer. And it makes me ask some questions. Here are the questions I've been asking myself all week. Who are you loving? Well, I, okay, let's tick it off. Okay, I already said I love myself. Check. Got that one down. I love my wife. To the extent of sacrificing myself in death, I think so. I really do. I believe I would do that. I don't think I would even question that. Check. If it was like falling into a pit of snakes for her, I'd think about it first. But yes, check. I know she'd think about it with me. So don't, don't, don't get on me for that. Check. Okay. My children... All right, most of the time, 99% of the time, check, okay. Extended family, maybe parents, grandparents, you know, it's, it's coming down a little bit, the number's dropping, the percentage, but it's, it's probably still pretty high. <clears throat> but then I start going out from there, and the people I know the best are the people in my church, I imagine that's true for you. Would you die for that person sitting next to you in church? Would you actually die for that person? You start thinking, okay, maybe, maybe I would. Jesus died on the cross for you because he loves you. And he says to you, you must love others to the same threshold that I love you. And I sit there and say, that's incredible. What Jesus has just said here is absolutely incredible. And I think sometimes we substitute friendliness for love. 
we substitute being nice for being loving. There's lots of things we do for people that are nice, lots of ways we can be friendly. I'm going to tell you, we have a friendly church. We have one of the friendliest churches you will ever meet. I, I don't know why the Lord arranged it that way, um, but it's, it's fun to come to church for me. I enjoy it because I like being with my friends. Uh, we have a very friendly church. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a big difference between friendship and love and having a real love. And when you start thinking about friendliness and love and how they're different, you start thinking about people like single adults who are lonely, who would love to have a relationship with you, or older adults who are also lonely, who would love to have a relationship with you. Or, or what about a church member who's having spiritual issues? And you start thinking about those spiritual issues, and you, I don't want that around. I don't want that junk in my life. I don't have to mess with that. And all of a sudden, you start making excuses for why it's okay for you not to really love that person. Like Jesus said we should love. And then I started thinking maybe there are people who they struggle to love because they are so needy of love. And they feel like maybe they can't even survive without someone reaching out to them in love. And then I think, but they should love. God calls them to love too. They should be showing love to others too. They should be giving to others too. So I guess it comes down to this question. What threshold? Where is your threshold? And this is what I want you to meditate on. I, I really don't even think an invitation is worthwhile. Because you can give the, you know, the kind of invitations. Do you love God? Everybody come forward. And then everybody comes forward, except the three real honest people in the back who said, I, I do love God, but I'm, I'm not going forward. Or they're, maybe they're just stubborn or whatever. But they sit in the back. But then everybody else comes forward. Have, have you ever seen an invitation like that? I've seen a few of those in my life. You could do one of those, but I'm not sure that would be valuable here. What I really want you to do is meditate. Where's my threshold? How much am I willing to give sacrificially to other people because I love them because Jesus has commanded me to do it? Because I'm going to remain in Jesus' love. I mean, think about it like this. At what threshold did you want Jesus to love you? <laughs> you know, I'm really glad Jesus loves me so we can talk with each other. I'm really glad he lets me pray to him. I'm really glad he gave me the Bible and his spirit so he, I can have guidance in my life. I'm really glad for some of that. Okay, where's the threshold you say? But, you, you know, it's okay, Jesus, if you stop loving me at this point. Where's that threshold in your life? You know that's unlimited. You know it's. I want Jesus to love me to the very fullest extent that he can love. Okay, well, where's your threshold in loving other people? Where's your extent to where you say, I'll love up to this point and then no more? I've given too much. I've loved too much. And ultimately what I'm asking you, what is your capacity to love others? Jesus loves me. This I know. But do you love me? Do I love you? That I'm not so sure about. But Jesus commands me to love. He commands me to love. As he has loved me. Let's pray. Lord, now I know, Lord, that this is one of those messages that it needs time to percolate. We, we have to think and meditate and muse about what you mean here. It's just not easily absorbed. The, the concepts are easily understood. Okay, we have to love others. But really doing it is different. So what I want, Holy Spirit, you to do, please, is just bring this back to mind throughout this week, maybe even throughout the month, that we would really meditate on what it means to love others as you have loved us in the same manner, to the same extent that you loved us. Realizing that you gave up your life for us because we are your friends because we are your followers, because we are branches in the vine. Help us, Lord, to be a loving church, to really, truly love other people. 
not just to say that we do, but to really be that way. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Let's just take a time to meditate on what we've heard this morning, the words of, the, of Jesus as the piano plays.